knowing that we're more effective together. Based on the registration survey, um, many here are concerned about international students facing cultural barriers and marginalization on campus. Others are seeking more information about how to help students navigate campus services, financial hardships, visa questions, and academic advising, among other things. This is a discussion more than a presentation, and we'll invite you to exchange ideas and explore issues together. We've organized this session around a series of questions with a sincere interest in your perspective. To allow for deeper conversations, we'll create small groups using breakout rooms for those of us joining via Zoom. Along the way, members of various academic service units have generously agreed to share insights and advice based on their long-standing support of international students. Last and probably least, we the organizers will chime in with, along the way with a few thoughts and suggestions on the topic. Our hope is that this discussion will not only generate ideas for better supporting international students, but will also help build relationships and grow a network of advocates to continue to share thoughts and resources with one another. Okay, now Sam Sharma will lead us in our group, first group discussion. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and welcome everybody. We have a, a quick warm up discussion. As a faculty or staff member, what do you or could you do to support international students who are feeling especially vulnerable or anxious, considering the lingering impacts of the 20, post 2016 politics and the pandemics? We wanted you to share your thoughts in small groups or pairs before we share ours. Um, please also address the second question in brief. Uh, what would you like to learn or achieve from this session? Uh, for those on Zoom, please write a response in the chat if you can, so other people can also see. This is not an in-depth conversation. We just wanted to start off by giving the colleagues a chance to say hi to a few people um, so that everybody has a chance to speak and uh, get to know some other colleagues who are also advocates of international students. So we'll open up the breakout room. Okay, um, I you have to like discussion to get to know each other a little bit more, um, just to get you familiar with everyone. That was our goal for this little mini discussion. Um, we're going to move on and just sort of introduce some support services that are available on the campus. And we have some folks join us today in our in their busy schedule. They came all the way here to um, give us some information. First from the counseling center, we have Linda. Okay. Should I come over there? Yes, okay. <laughs> well, hi. That's good, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. The camera is over there. The camera goes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, looking at it. <laughs> yes. So, hi, I'm Smita. I'm a clinical psychologist on campus. I'm the director of the Center for Prevention and Outreach, and I do work very closely with counseling and psychological services. So, I'm representing both at this point of time. So, just a couple of things to remember for international students all services are free on campus, completely free. And it's not just the counseling services, but there are myriad services available. And I will not go through a tackle of a list. But something I really want to focus on is very, very new. Most people don't know. It's called timely care. Okay, there's a cat in the room. In the room. It's the instruction ones. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a great response. <laughs> so timely care basically is online virtual counseling as well as healthcare uh, healthcare uh, for students. All our students, it's for registered students, so they can get 12 sessions from a counselor who's a New York State registered counselor, free of cost. I know most international students are working in the labs, they're free at nine o'clock. When we close at five o'clock, so they want an appointment at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, which gets really hard for a lot of international students. But if you are registered with Timely Care, they're campus specific, you can get an appointment at any time with a counselor who's a New York State licensed clinician and you get 12 sessions free. The other part is talk now services because a lot of time, like at three in the morning, you're talking like I was an international student, like I'm talking to someone from my home country and it's three, I need to talk to someone at 3 a.m. nobody's open over here, right? So who do I talk to? 
So as a part of primary care, you have talk now services where you can connect with a clinician anywhere in the United States within three to four minutes to have one session just to talk out whatever you're going through. And talking out really, really, really helps to kind of elevate the problem that you're facing and really decompress. Other than that, medical services, because I know insurance in this country is really difficult to navigate really difficult to understand, navigate. And we have had issues with international students who really did not understand how to navigate into medical services. So as a part of timely care, we have healthcare providers on call who you can register for a medical appointment and get to see a provider and their script can be written and sent to the pharmacy of their choice. So these are all virtual services that are present for international students, but we are on campus too, but on campus services are nine to five. They get all medical care services free, counseling, psychiatry services, group sessions. At Center for Prevention Outreach, we do even more, a lot of prevention and early intervention services. So there are four areas that we work, right? Sexual violence prevention, alcohol and other drugs, mental health suicide prevention, as well as general health promotion. I will go through some of these things pretty quick, but it's important to know. So for sexual violence, one service that is particularly I want to focus on is we have a survivor advocate on campus who's a 24 seven service to really navigate a student any experience of violence and what to do, how to report it's confidential, but it's a non-clinical service, right? Just to help navigate the systems over here. For alcohol and other drugs, we have a lot of classes, workshops, which you can find on our uh, website. But one thing is we know a lot of students are recovering and struggling with recovery. So we have worked with LI Thrive who come on campus to provide recovery services on campus, right? And I'm giving you just tip of the iceberg so it's in, in, it interest you to look into our website and kind of find out more information. For health promotion, we do give out a lot of products, pre-menstrual hygiene products. Uh, we have flu kits, all these products that people get for completely free from our, from our office. So they can fill up a form and get the products, right? Tampons are seriously expensive. They're getting off the shelf. So those are like some of the challenges that we can easily mitigate. Right now, student health services have expanded their services and something new that they have added, especially after Roe versus Wade, you can get plan B for $20, which is the cheapest anywhere you can get, right? Pregnancy tests are only $5, again, cheapest anywhere you can get. So there's a lot available, but one of the basic problems that we have, we have a lot of stuff and we have students who need stuff. But the connection and bridges are really hard to make. And I'm so glad you're doing this because this is another forum to make connections and see people and see their faces. And if you need any information, just connect with me and I can give you more information. That's one of my questions. How do we get this information out to the students? We have tried every which way. So these things are in the scale <laughs> screen. These are going to as emails to all students. So every information is present, but it's almost like when you don't need it, mm -hmm. you don't pay attention to it, right? These are emails have gone at least 30 times to all students. And I still talk to students who have no idea this is happening, right? right? So it's like, again, the more people know about this information and kind of then can I say, hey, I heard about timely care. Have you heard about timely care? It's all on the website. It's all on the website. There's thousands of email outreach. We have peer educators, like 51, 55 peer educators who are at different points of campus, really helping students navigate resources on campus. But we know we have a massive campus. We'll still miss people. So the more people know, the better we are. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, is there any way we can inform our students um, international students uh, in the classroom, for example, because we do have uh, also, you know, individual conferences with our students. Uh, if some of them are really struggling, is there any way we can help them uh, as their uh, instructors? Absolutely. So if students are really struggling, so you can absolutely help them. So one place I say is the easiest way to start as an instructor is the student support team. So I don't have a slide presentation, but I can send you more information. Student support team is a part of Dean of Students Office and they kind of help students to figure out where to go next. And the struggle may be because of a medical situation, struggle maybe because of a death in the family and they need some time off. Whatever the struggle is, medical, mental health, student support team really is the first conduit to kind of really understand what the student needs and then pass it out to other places that they may need, right? You can send them to counseling and psychological services. I did not mention we do have care team, which is 
almost like a, a team which looks into students in distress and disruptive students. So if you're concerned about a student who's not taking care, who's harm to others or harm to self, we have consult, accept, refer, and educate you, which is again, the information is available on the website. And you can kind of uh, connect the student to this team that gets the student in, figures out what's going on, and there's a large, uh, it's, a, it's a multidisciplinary team that we really try to figure out what to do and how to help the student. The other phase, which I did not mention, again, I'm saying so many things without a PowerPoint, so I'm really, really sorry. It's called the Red Book. So it's www.stonybrook.edu backslash Red Book. I was the one who wrote it with another of my colleagues. Because in Storybrook, we have so many web pages. And if you want the information about one, so you go to one and then you can't find the other one. It's, it's always like that, right? So Red Book, we try to keep all the information up to date. So you have the counseling service information, the care team information, what to do when your student is experiencing different kinds of distress from uh, emotional distress to death of a student, what to do. It's a one-stop shop. So kind of get to know very quickly who are the numbers to call. So if you don't remember much, if you remember the red book, that's one step to kind of bridge the gap. And a question in the chat, is there Thank an app you. or a website? It's just a website. You don't have app. Thank you. Have you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I would love for someone to do it, but yeah, right now it's just a website. Other questions? I guess we should also move on because uh, I think some of the things, questions we could ask on the chat and keep answering them. Um, I think we are running out of time in terms of our scheduled time for the quick highlights. We do have other guests. Um, Christina Faina from the library is joining us via Zoom here to tell us a little bit more about the library resources. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this. And I, I'm stepping in for Janet Clark at the last minute, so I'm going to do the best I can. But please uh, ask any questions if I if you want to learn more. Or if I don't um, cover everything, but I just I just want to say you know academic research papers. The uh, the research paper is one of the most daunting things that all students do when they get to the university. It's it's really overwhelming, and you know I have Zoom consultations with students who end up in tears, <laughs> um, whether they're international or not. And so for international students, it's, it's it can be a real challenge. And there's a number of things the library does to support students. I mean, just the first thing is, you know, just having an extra person to uh, reach out to. If, you know, maybe they've talked to their professor about it, but they just need another, another person, another um, set of ears to listen or to help them figure out their topic. We have consultations with students and we do this in multiple modalities. And so, uh, you know, the library website, in fact, should I share my screen? Would that, would that be a useful thing? I don't know if I'm allowed to share it real quick. Would that be okay? You should be able to, yep. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Oh, I gotta stop my screen, hold on. Go ahead. All right. Um, just do this. And I mean, I'm sure that most of you are familiar already with the library website, but just in case, there's multiple, multiple ways to get help from a librarian. This Ask Us chat is on every single page of the library website. And I think text is often a really friendly way for international students to get help rather than coming in and, and speaking. I know whenever we do online workshops and events, always turn on that transcription so they can read it because sometimes reading uh, and going back and forth that way is um, a, an easier way for them to, to communicate. And so in terms of that modality, we have the chat, which they can always reach out to a library and the chat hours are always right here. And this Ask a Librarian footer is on every web page, and you can learn about all the different ways to get help. Um, we have librarians that liaise to academic departments. So if it's a psychology paper, they can find the psychology librarian and reach out to that person. I'm the liaison for writing and rhetoric, and so I work a lot with students for the Writing 101 and Writing 102 research papers. Um, so lots of help in that regard. There's also a consultation form here, just in terms of extra support. Uh, we're here, we wanna help them through their research papers. These library databases uh, can be tricky and can be a challenge. 
Um, another thing I'll just mention in regards to the library databases, uh, while I'm here, I might as well show you guys. A lot of these tools have language filters. So for example, you know, the vast majority of the, res the resources are in English, but there are ways to find articles specifically written in specific languages. So, you know, if we just check the Spanish filter here, um, there is a way, these filters are not perfect, as you can see, you know, I'm not, it's, but here, for example, is a Spanish title. And so they would click into the article and uh, here it is. It's, it's a Spanish language article. Another thing I find when I am working with international students in the library sessions, just in case you don't know, we as librarians do come into your classroom. Um, if you want to request instruction, I'll just show you that link real quick. It's right here on the library website and you can request the class or just email me. I'll put my email in the chat before I'm done. <laughs> um, but when we're in, when I'm in the class working with students, I find that a lot of international students, when they're doing research, they get really excited and their eyes light up quite a bit when I show them the Nexus Uni database. This, we have almost 500 databases and there's lots of fun things to look through, but they often get really excited. Oh, ah. <laughs> um, I have to clear my cache. Uh, but in Nexus Uni, when you go in Nexus Uni, there's hundreds of international publications in there. And you can, when they're searching and when they're trying to find information, if it, you can search by location. And so you can search in newspapers from their home country if they're familiar with a partic particular publication. Um, that's something that, that really, um, it's just an, an extra resource that can, add to their works cited list in a way if they want to read about it or just for fun right just on the side if they want to do some reading um anything else um of course they can always request specific resources they can request books there's request rec there's recommendations for resources forms and we have events and workshops that support everyone on campus and I know that you guys are in a hurry, so I'm going to stop there. But let me put my email in the chat. Thank you so much, Christine, for making the time today and providing us with all those resources. The last resource we really want to introduce you is the International Student Success Resources by Kristen Liu. Can we go back to our screen sharing? So before I go jump onto the website again, uh, I want to show you one slide really quick. Oh, sorry, sorry. So I know as you are registering for today's session that you were all asked to fill out a very long registration form. You're like, oh my gosh, this is too difficult for me to sign up for something I want to do more. But through that, we were able to capture. So when we asked you the question, what are you looking forward to get out of today's session? And that's a word cloud of your responses. So you can see the largest part in this word cloud is to support students international or to support, I think, international students. Mm -hmm. I can't manage to make it change. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at that now. With that being said, I think I often, like one of the first terms, interesting terms I heard after coming to the United States, being an international student myself, is to hear, it takes a village to raise a kid, right? Mm -hmm. Then I think, I definitely think that it takes a village to help international students with the audience that are in the room as well as on Zoom. So I also have my partner in crime here, Michelle Shinke, who actually is the brain behind this wonderful website you're looking at. Um, is the International Student Success website that developed by the Office of Global Affairs and my, my colleague, May Yu May, or may not be able to see her through this camera. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to, if Rose can kind of um, follow my lead going through. Sure. So if you wanted to, the charter or past the success is a, like the form and the interactive one where if if you felt like you have an international student they're like i want to get involved but i don't know where to find that information or i'm stressed i have financial struggles like like any type of question you might encounter the students can go onto the iss page and by click the start here button we are asked about their role it will take a couple minutes too as you can see the navigation is like even if that's consistent with the top navigation categorism by a new students, 
on the writer students and graduate students and based on their self-selected answers can can we select undergrad from here and based on their self-selected answers and based on their answers to some of those questions because sometimes we, we you know we learn the way of when we have a student in front of us we ask them tons of questions right but when we give them a website website has a title if they don't know what's behind that title chances are they don't click on that title so with that in mind the the um form is actually developed in a way to help them navigate through some of the challenges that they might have or may, they may not even know they might be coming here for financial aid related then all of a sudden they can also get some academic resources so obviously uh, we can leave this in the chat room for the link where you can go with them explore more on your own um and i will switch it back to katie since we're on a time crunch and to move on to some of the next part okay thank you so much um all right now we're going to have a small group discussion um let's do another brief discussion in groups of three that shift the focus from specialized units to what we can do in collaboration or at least in consultation with different services and academic units so have you ever collaborated or consulted with other faculty and or staff about the unique challenges of international students? And what do you see as the distinct roles of faculty and staff in supporting our international students? So please just take a few minutes and share with one another. And uh, we'll begin to explore this, this relationship, this sort of partnership between faculty and staff. Sorry, we have to cut short on the discussion a little bit. We're kind of like rushing through this here. But um, I was just eavesdropping into some of the discussion that was going on. And um, it seems like uh, a lot of us agree that like, there's abundance of resources on campus, but it is overwhelming for a lot of students, especially international students, to navigate around all of these resources. And so we can hopefully jointly collaborate and, and become the bridge to help them connect with these numerous resources. Um, now, Sam, I'm going to turn it to you so he can talk a little bit more about the challenges that international students are facing post-2016. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. colleagues. Um, I am going to highlight just a few things, but I will say one or two things in the beginning. I'm, I'm someone um, who does research and writing and travels around the country to give workshops and talks and faculty uh, development uh, uh, talks and workshops to faculty as well as students on international student success. And I've written a book and many articles. And I have always felt guilty that on my own campus, I'm not really connected to the, all of the wonderful people from around campus who are actually supporting students in a lot of different ways. And this project is a dream come true for me. What I have found in my research, if I could summarize all of my research that I've done by in, in, across the country is that whenever the advocates of international students are connected, whenever they are collaborative, collaborating, connect, con having conversations, sharing, recommending each other, the university environment radically changes. But wherever there is siloed and hyper-specialized and no connection and no communication, even in Ivy League universities, I've seen that the overconfidence in the hyper-specialization of support systems with no connections among them and no advocacy and no collaboration really let isolated students and they were lost and confused. International students are happy at campuses where these kind of connections existed. So I'm gonna really highlight that international students are creatures of the ecology. They are not, they don't take normal approaches to formal support systems. Again, they do not take normal approaches to formal support systems because formal support systems are not enough. A lot of times they have a lot of gaps because international students are extremely diverse and extremely complex. So for one moment, as I take another two, four minutes, three minutes, please imagine for a moment that our separate, distinct, specialized support systems are not what we're talking about today. Imagine, close your eyes and imagine international students who are very multidimensional in their needs and strengths and um, understanding about not right? So let's set aside the hyper-specialization on the side and let's really focus on the full complex student. So first, uh, there are two, two kinds of things that I wanna highlight. 
The first is the post-Trump era, post-2016 political climate that has led to violence um, and, and um, hatred and host hostility and that has sometimes seeped into campus. They're, they seem isolated, but they are, have, have become significantly more than before. And there are other things like, uh, you know, things that we don't even think about, parental concerns, like a, how do you, how does a student deal with a Korean mother who constantly calls about gun violence? You may think like, wow, uh, how does that even relate to what I do? It does because it affects the student. The student is panicky because of an incident on campus or beyond. Um, so the other challenge is this, the, the, the visa challenge, the new restrictions, the impacts on academic performance because of this new political landscape. Now, you may think that Trista will take care of that and my job is only to teach. Actually, that student may be absent from class because he was panicking that he loses his visa status. And this is exactly why for more than any other students, it is important to look at the holistic well-being of international students and ask what, what could, uh, we could do to accommodate or to at least understand. It is not hard to observe and try to mitigate stress that is caused by increased awareness of our sensitivity towards prejudice. To use small acts of kindness and care so international students feel like they belong in our campus. So that component of I care, let me know, what can I do? Sorry, I can do anything. Go here, let me call someone or give just a resource. And today when colleagues were sharing and highlighting resources from different places, I was taking notes. I call myself an international student success, transition and success expert researcher, but I'm learning about the resources and services on campus and I feel terrible and good. <laughs> and there is direct and severe impacts of some of the things on some of the students, like students, uh, DACA students, students from the Muslim banned countries, students from the particular groups, women students, and I was so glad to learn about the resources available to female students. And cultural differences make a difference. Sometimes the way in which women understand their bodies and uh, the challenges are very distinct and they may not utilize the services because they don't know how to navigate the system due to gender and culture and other factors. On the other side are the post-pandemic impacts. The, the economic recession and inflation has caused financial constraints Imagine this, when I came to the US 17 years ago, the exchange rate in my home country was 68 units per dollar. Now it is exactly the, double that amount. You know that the, the American inflation has inflated the rate uh, value of the dollar by a significant amount across the world. Even Europeans find it harder to buy our products now. And that means the financial burden is simply inflated even without our tuition and, and, and fees going up. So these kinds of global financial, global socioeconomic, global geopolitical impacts are things that are beyond our, our domain, beyond our, our you know, uh, understanding, but they do impact and we need to be conscious about it. Let us be flexible in our course and grading policies uh, because the global health concerns, travel restrictions, quarantines and anxieties take a toll on students. Let's take a different approach from attendance to engagement. So we used to say, you have to attend so many times, you can be absent so many times. What if we may have to make an exception and say, as long as you can catch up, I'm willing to work with you on this issue on a case by case basis. Well, issues of plagiarism, technological landscape has changed. We're stuck with our old worldviews. Pedagogical responsibility. What is a pedagogical responsibility for a teacher during a pandemic? Because it is not simply absence, it is a health, a crisis, death in the family, and so on. Let us network and learn and recommend opportunities and services, I was saying, because virtual education is limiting in social interaction, social immersion opportunities. A lot of colleagues were like, oh, I'm gonna go online. And like, sometimes think about it. Somebody came 12,000 miles away from home to peek through a hole and call it an education. It's not. It's not the same thing, especially for international students, the, the contact and the full experience of the environment and the culture and the food and the friendship matters. And we can extend our teaching and our staff and uh, service support in that direction. Mass classrooms make it difficult for them to talk. International students more than anybody else because they cannot listen and but without being able to read our lips. We may need to have whole new pedagogical training, whole new staff training, 
or at least conversation to connect, study groups. And in this uh, project, in this grand project, we have a book reading book club. Uh, please join us to read books together and to discuss because we could be leading the conversation as well as supporting each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Okay, next we'll hear from um, Sony from the Program for Writing and Rhetoric to hear a little bit about the faculty perspective and um, observations from the classroom. Uh, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm Sonia Dikari from Program in Writing and Rhetoric, and I would like to share uh, how faculty members can go an extra mile and address the challenge of international students, uh, because we are there to, uh, uh, you know, experience um, uh, our students' challenge, uh, you know, in our teaching, in our daily teaching. So let me share how, as a faculty member, uh, we can go extra mile and help them address their challenges. One of the things that can make a big difference is when we try to understand the full picture of international students' educational experiences here. For example, if a student is not understanding what you are teaching, we should not just assume that it is due to their language proficiency. Most of the time we find that it is due to language proficiency that they don't understand. It's maybe, it may be, but it's not everything. It may be the student, it may be that the student is confused by certain concepts that would make no sense, even if we were teaching in their home language. The concept of class discussion doesn't make a lot of sense if you are teaching about a topic that is very local here and very foreign to international students. It makes sense for us to lay the foundation first. International students may also be experiencing many other struggles from homesickness to financial challenges to jet lag to stress and so on. Uh, and they may not know or have the confidence to use available resources. Inquiring about their health and well being can encourage them to excel in their course. Asking if they are facing any challenges while living so far away from their home can help them to talk about their challenges. And also, finding one significant person to talk to seems to help a lot. Uh, broadly speaking, there is a layer of mentoring responsibility that fac faculty members must take when it comes to international students. I think we should encourage them to share their stories of struggle more than we used to do before. In other words, I think that we can make a big difference when we help international students to develop their confidence, to speak, to connect, to take risks, to utilize available resources, and to come to us for help. Our task is to motivate them. Since many international students become hyper-conscious about their linguistic barrier, we can help them to boost their confidence by encouraging them to share their learning experience in their home countries. This could help them to speak in class, allowing them to slowly acclimate in new academic environment. They need to know that developing overall academic skill is more important than just paying excessive attention to language. This encouragement can help them connect with more people and to take risks when, where needed. There are a large range of factors that motivate international students to perform well, including psychological, social, economic, and geopolitical. The factors that provide a framework that could be adapted to the study of how international students invest their time and energy in course. Often, we, re we must re rethink and update our courses, assignments, and assessment when international students are in our class. It is not enough to expect them to adapt to us. We must also adapt to their needs. This may sound like an impossible demand, but when we make adjustment, often we learn that we can do better teaching for all students, um, international and even domestic as well. We can make learning more engaging, and course content more accessible and so on. We must also update mentoring practices. We may need to add office hours, sometimes even extra office hours, right? Learn um, actively about students and update classroom teaching. Uh, require in-person office hours or at least add the option because you cannot do justice to international students just by doing the virtual meetings. Uh, and encouraging students to explore as many academic opportunities as possible, such as applying for internship, study abroad program, and other on-campus work opportunities. 
they decide to go far away from they decided to go far away from home for their education because they wanted a full range of experience and not just coursework and we may need to update our course policies for example i give international student an extra day of extension and sometimes even a couple of days because i know that it is it takes longer for them to read and harder for them to write case by case considerations to take unique um, challenges of international students as well as challenges that are more intense for them thank you Thank you, Sony. I had planned on saying a few things about how um, important it is to help build connections with our international students and help them um, give them opportunities to create their own confidence in the classroom and emphasizing the contributions that they make to the campus community. But I think that that's exactly what Sony is describing. Um, if we if people are interested in thinking more about this participation imperative that we have in our classrooms and rethinking that, in um, this moment, then join us for the next workshop, where we're really going to be focused on engaging uh, international students in the classroom and beyond. But um, next, we'll hear from Teresa. Thank you. I know you might have seen this as you, the Zoom was getting ready to start, and I know not everyone is a numbers person, and this graphic will probably give you a headache. Um, but I thought about this graphic when I was reading some of the registration comments about the challenge that you see in your daily work with international students. And it really bugs me because some of the comments I saw that are deeply right and for, and, and I'm, I'm reciting it doesn't mean that I'm calling you out, right? Because you are right in the experience that you have seen. But I think the data maybe can help us understand what happened in the past and what is, what is with our expectation and how can we use that knowledge to move forward. So some of the comments I have seen is the student's motivation level concern. Right, what you might the professors might have experienced about our international students and their motivation level changed, whether it's because of the post uh, 2016 situation or whether it's because post COVID when everybody's learning and adjusting this online new environment. Right, that motivation, that participation, dramatically changed. But I think from someone who like had been a process of this 10 years of international. Um, education development, whether as a student or now as a profession, like you can see from the graphics on the left that in the past we had more graduate students coming to the United States to study compared to undergraduate students. And that definitely changed. And we then that grad, undergraduate student <laughs> booming started um, in the year of 2015 and all the way up into 2019. At least that's our Stony Book reality, right? And I think many of other large international student related um, institutions in the US are seeing the same thing. And, and on the other side, you will see like, so on the left side, I'd say enrollment numbers, right? On the right side is the um, degree completion numbers. So this is kind of another showing that there are more, more interest of the undergraduate degree seeking students where maybe the professors and in the past years, when you thought about international students in 2012, you thought about that motivated master level student wanting to achieve. But now in your undergraduate career teaching class, one of the classes you saw that struggling international student doesn't know where to eat on campus, right? That's dramatically different because of the reality of the students that are coming into the campus. And how as us as professionals and also as faculties kind of adjust our expectation and knowing and meeting the students where they are is something that we are worth considering. If you can please advance the next slide. So these are a quick poll out of everyone that who registered for this workshop. And based on your responses of the top struggles, common struggles before COVID, before 2016, versus the unique challenges that our participants have reported after COVID and after 2016. Well, you can see the top three are literally almost the same. So even we think that, yes, I am not undermining, there are changes, there are stress, there are ad additional things that are happening, which is on, adding on top of all the pre-existing challenges for international students before COVID. But again, the culture shock, the visa, the, the financial, and especially number five, they added not welcoming the United States environment, whether it's Long Island or larger United States in general, are and the increased mental health issues because of the added burden throughout 
the, that they had already existed in the past, but now continue to be even bigger. But I think the benefit of this is, I think looking at this actually calms me more than worries me. The reason is at least the participants in the room or the ones that are joining us on Zoom online, you are already aware of this. So we as professionals are aware of this and it's always easier if we wanting to intentionally looking for information, whether through the existing resources at um, the CPO and counseling center or with our global affairs areas to see if are these areas have workshops or services that can support our international students. So if you could please go to the next slide. So I know this is our, one of the things that I use to train my student leaders, um, my international student mentors, and uh, um, in the past, the orientation leaders, about their understanding of the international student. And then you can see there are four, as we would say, like the larger areas, the leading and understanding of the US culture, the leading adjusting, uh, the culture shock, and they're struggling of getting involved, whether it's they participating in your class or they are participating in a club, or is they apply, are they applying for an internship or job opportunities that all kind of falls under that area. So with that being said, if we can put up the international student success page again, this is another reason I didn't want to spend more time earlier, but um, if we click on the undergraduate piece, just as an example, and you will go, go click on the academic resources piece. And it's will take a little moment. If you want to scroll down a little bit. So if we wanted to click on the IPFA for international students piece, you will see the four um, categories where we see our international students challenged the most are happen to be exactly the four categories where we develop those workshops around. So, and I know I send out emails to students every week and I have wonderful colleagues here at the writing department to give students extra credit for going to those sessions, which I, you know, forever grateful for the past year, uh, seven years. Um, and these are the reasons, like you are the reason that maybe your recommendation to that student can weigh into them walking into that workshop door and getting something from that workshop session, that is something that actually can help them succeed and it pertains to their needs. And even though I send them emails every week, they still gonna tell you I never had <laughs> This is the reason why, right? We are here today so we can score down a little bit. So we have different sessions for new students and the continuing time students at an undergraduate level. And if you click on the graduate level uh, workshops, uh, my colleague um, Michelle Shinke also hosts iGrad workshops that are pertaining to our graduate student needs. And if you, and especially talking to my audience in Zoom right now, if you as a professor thinks there is a workshop, you definitely think we should cover for graduate students, and we are not, we're not already doing it, please, please, please send us an email and let us know so we can include that. So um, that iGrad student workshop is the one that I'm referring to. All right, so we can go back to my slide. Thank you, Rose, for doing all these You're switching welcome. and doing things. Um, and the next slide is something I used to show to our new international students when they arrived to campus. You're like, uh, I have a PhD, why you're showing Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? So when, I, I know the busy work we do, the profession that we're in, we oftentimes forgot what it was like initially. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is when you see your students not engaging in your class, it may not be their bad students. It may be other things that mm -hmm. bothers them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. That bothers them that has not been met, right? So I know as researchers, you're all very curious about why things work, how things work. So as professionals, I think we should all be always be curious about beyond whatever the level we see and see if there are other things that are going on that we can refer them to. If you can please go to the next slide. This is also in a slide I showed to new international students at their orientation in the past, uh, which I think from a personal experience, and I know many other international students in the room that probably would agree with me, that we are constantly on this transition stage. We're always, and that's transferable, right? Like that transferable as like whether you are international or not. Because when they first come here, they're transitioning from a different environment. And then they, they are have that psychological you know, transition if they're undergraduate students. When we are experienced working with graduate students, we may not see undergraduate students just by the 
way they are they bring us through developing. They're just not ready to understand and to plan to critical think of some of the other elements where our graduate students are more comfortable in doing and more motivated in doing. And they are always, you know, transitioning from the dependent learning depends on the education background that they are coming from. They're being taught to, lectured at, versus the independent curiosity research and study. So that's a struggle that they are experiencing, and that's another transition they are doing. And I think the last two is, is funny to me because oftentimes I'm like, oh, I adjusted into the US culture, I'm good. Then the moment whether they revisited their family back home or four years or six years later, they are going home for their like, job or whatever, they oftentimes would have that anxiety of their reverse culture shock of things are not the same. Like my understanding and my board view are completely altered. And sometimes I say that to my colleagues a lot, like I feel like I'm not Chinese enough because that's a reserve, reverse culture shock that we have always been experiencing. And we, as international students, I think those transition stages and the challenges we experience throughout our development, throughout like whether we moved on, meaning we graduated, we are still experiencing that in a some level constantly going back and forth. And I want to use this as a segment to advance to our next discussion by inviting our uh, International Student Advisory Council members up to the stage to share about, I think I'm gonna say it out loud, you're just gonna remember what you're gonna hear about. So we wanted, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to utilize this time to get ready in front of the room. But I do wanna ask you, um, what chairs, what are school? I do wanna ask you to think about one challenge, share with us one challenge, as an international student, you experienced when you first come to the US and share us with one challenge that you are still experiencing now in your capacity as an international student. And the things I always like, and on a high note, um, one thing would be if there were a past experience that you had uh, where a professional or a professor did something to you that you remember that helped you and you remember that you to this day, or whether it's that your friend's story, please also do share that with us. So in here we have in the room, you can see my Zoom um, producer can see it on the slide. We have Seon Kim, who is an undergraduate student in health science major from South Korea. And then we also have Veronica, um, is a graduate student. Actually, Veronica finished her undergraduate here at Slimbook as well, uh, from Costa Rica. And then we have Nicole, who is our PhD candidate, congratulations, um, in the anthropology department from Argentina. And uh, take it away. Uh, so one thing when you started you challenged you were challenged as an international student where would that be um challenge i want to start with my my own, own experience with one of the professor who changed my career plan, like school career, career plan after the conversation. So um, I'm a health science major. What I wanted to do as a health science major was getting into one of their clinical concentration, which, which was anesthesia technology, which requires the licensure. And then um, I decided to go in there in this path. And I talked to one of my professor in, my minor class, my in my minor class, and um, I was I was having conversation about my career plan in anesthesia technology, and she told me to look it up if anesthesia technology is available like available job in Korea. So if this job exists exists in our country, and I I never thought about searching it up this job in my country because I I don't know but. I thought it would be available in my country, but I looked it up and it was, the job wasn't exist in my country. So mm -hmm. after this conversation, I had to change my whole career plan from anesthesia technology to different healthcare profession. So, and then I was very passionate about finding my career path since freshman. So I, I have talked to a lot of academic advisors, professors, and they've never, talk like ask, ask me about ask um question about like what 
the professor told me like find if look it up if this job is available things like this so i wish we ha have more chance to um talk to about my academic plans to someone who knows what international students like the differences between a regular student and international student to find a career path mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you Veronica. Um, okay, so when Trista first sent us the email um, saying like, oh, please share an experience you've had um, with a faculty or staff member who's helped you, I kind of panicked because I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> so, I think to talk to a lot of my friends, um, international student friends, both uh, people who graduated, some people who transferred or current undergraduate students to see like, kind of like, who's helped them. And now listening to your presentation, I've realized I've actually utilized a lot of the resources that um, you've exposed. So um, like visa and immigration services has always been um, very helpful to me. Um, they're always very quick with their responses and very helpful. Um, but most of my friends really, especially the ones who graduated, talked a lot about the career center. Like as international students, um, after we graduate and we apply for OTP, we only have like three months to find a job. And um, they raved about the career center, like um, the online resources um, really helped them find a job. Yeah, so uh, my experience as a graduate student, a PhD student, is a little bit um, different. Um, I came here in 2017, and I think that the major challenge for me was to adapt to the expectations and to the uh, the workflow I expected in an R1 uh, research focused institution. Uh, so I come from Argentina, I come from a very small university, and I, as soon as I finished my undergrad there, I came here to the U.S. Uh, with a Fulbright scholarship uh, to start my PhD. Uh, so in that sense, um, you know, adapting to, you know, time management, planning, um, and basically adapting to a new role and a new set of expectations and uh, all the demands that are, are, you know, best upon you in terms of you know, producing, being productive, and, you know, prioritizing your academic career above uh, many other uh, things. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all you so much. Positive comments in the chat for you guys. Okay. <laughs> Positive comments for the chat for you guys, just in case you hear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nico is great. I've worked with him. He's amazing. <laughs> okay. In light of all that we've heard today from the faculty, the staff, and the students, I invite you to take a moment to discuss again in groups of three or four how you might widen your own network of support on campus. How can we improve communication between faculty and staff and support each other in becoming better advocates for our students? That might even include exchanging contact information here today. So um, let's take a moment and, and think about how we can leave here with uh, more resources in our back pocket. 